Thank you very much, Zoya. Um, so we're going to go through our presentations. I'm going to concentrate on the impact of geology on geomechanics and hydraulic fracturing, as well as some of the experimental side of the research that goes on at the University of Texas. And then McCool will pick up from me and, and focus more on the numerical aspects of what we do. So um, we're basically focusing on how hydraulic fracturing and the other technologies in horizontal wells has affected the shale boom that we've had in the last few years. My presentation is going to start talking a little bit about why hydraulic fracturing is important. What is a hydraulic fracture? I'll try and bring in some lessons from geology that we can learn from natural fractures. Look a little, and then look a little bit at some of the uh, testing we do in the laboratory at the sample scale coming from the subsurface as well as doing analog hydraulic fracture experiments. Firstly, let's, let me just remind you the importance of hydraulic fracturing. If you look at this plot that I've put on the screen, on the x-axis is time in months, so this is a total of 20 years. And the y-axis is cumulative production in thousands of cubic feet, so basically this is a million thousand cubic feet, so a billion, two billion, three billion, up to six billion cubic feet of cumulative gas production. Um, this first well, the red line that you see, is a well that was drilled in 1996. This is a vertical well with a single fracture. This is data, production data I downloaded from the Railroad Commission. And you can see after about 17 or so years, um, this particular well reached two billion cubic feet of cumulative gas produced. If we fast forward to 2011, a horizontal well with 15 fracks, that same that, that well in the Barnett Shale produced 2 billion cubic feet in about seven months. So this just highlights the impact that hydraulic fracturing, horizontal wells, and their innovative application by engineers and geologists in the field has had on the business of shale gas production. And you could point to similar type things in the oil business as well. Without fracturing, Basically, we would have no business in these shales. You can see this um, line at the bottom, which is our estimate of what just matrix production would give us in these environments. The impact to the United States, you can see on this plot, this is a, a rate plot now, not cumulative plot, but this is rate in BCF per day for the United States from 0 to 100, starting back in 1993, going to June of two, 2015. And you can see in the 2006 regime of time, U.S. conventional production took a steep decline, but it was, all, it was more than accounted for and replaced by unconventional production. So this has been a great boon to the business and to society to have this sort of production coming really from a technology play, which is our shale fracturing that's going on in the United States. So let me just um, talk real quickly about what hydraulic fracturing is as opposed to just regular fracturing. Um, oftentimes you hear people talk about hydraulic fracturing shattering the rock in the subsurface. And so I'm going to show you a quick video here about what, what I think of when, when um, somebody says shattering. This is an unconfined compressive test in the laboratory on a sample of sandstone, actually. Yeah, bang. And um, what I want to show, in an environment where there is no lateral confinement, this is an axial compression of these samples. Um, this kind of environment is not at all like what we see in the subsurface. Normally we would have rock all around this and stress playing on all sides. You can see shattering the rock in this unconfined um, space is actually possible. If we go to the next video, which is what hydraulic fracturing is like, where we have more significant containment and rather than failing the sample with um, compressive stress, we're actually injecting fluid at a controlled rate. We have an example that actually was published on YouTube from Colorado School of Mines. You can see we have a cased well and then open hole at the bottom, this white area is where the fluid is being injected. In order to get the, the experiment to go in real time, we, the, they have speeded it up by 64 times. And you can see the controlled growth of basically two fracture wings coming out from this well bore. And so this is more what hydraulic fracturing is like. It's a controlled, engineered, um, engineered experience in the subsurface under confinement. So it's not like shattering. It's not uncontrolled, wild um, explosion of the rock. So if we go on and look then, this, this I would argue that from the engineering standpoint, the gross fracture geometry we get is systematic and predictable. There are complications, but generally we know, if you look at this diagram, we have a vertical well 
um, that we've hydraulically fractured through perforations. If we take a bird's eye view of that, we expect the predominant direction of propagation growth to be parallel to SH max or the maximum horizontal stress. The opening is basically against SH min, which is a minimum horizontal stress. So that's our nominal expectation. Now in shales, we get a lot of more, um, a lot more complication from there, a, a much richer fracture propagation experience, and that's what the rest of my presentation and much of McCool's presentation will focus on today. So the first thing we do is basically figure out a way to put a well bore in the ground to take advantage of um, the nominal in situ stress directions. And so in hydraulic fracturing in shales, we're predominantly looking at horizontal wells that are drilled parallel to the minimum horizontal stress in the earth. And you can see these very simple looking symmetric ellipses are um, our nominal design for what the hydraulic fractures look like. We space them in a certain way to maximize production. <coughs> Excuse me. And we look at their heights and lengths. So let's take a look at geology and see what geology can tell us about how hydraulically driven fractures propagate through rocks. So here's an example of an outcrop in Wyoming. This is actually Muddy Gap. And what you're looking at is a Cretaceous sandstone. It's, it's dipping or is inclined from horizontal by about 30 degrees. You can see a geologist um, for scale here in the foreground. And essentially, the spacing between these fractures is very systematic, and their lengths are very significant. This spacing is actually due to the impact of the stress shadow effect in natural fracture propagation. And that same stress shadow effect that we find in natural fractures has a big impact on our hydraulic fractures. McCool will talk a little bit more about that in his modeling work. But you can see that these same concepts apply in the natural world. And we can get a, you can imagine drilling a well bore perpendicular to these fractures, and that would be comparable to one of our hydraulic fracture treatments in the subsurface. In shales, we often find that the natural fractures are much more intense than what we see in sandstone. So this diagram on the right with my um, Brunton compass, which is about six inches long for scale here, shows in the shales that I've got fracture spacing, natural fracture spacing on the order of inches. This can happen in many of these shales. They tend to have a much more intense fracturing. If we look at the layering that is common in shales, and here's an example from uh, uh, the Huron Shale in Ohio, which is Devonian or something on the order of 350 million years old. We have brittle shale layers, which I'm focusing on the, the bottom and top layer with my um, mouse here. And then in the middle, you can see there's a very ductile, um, more swelling type clay layer. And if you look at the impact of that ductile layer on the natural fracture propagation, you can see that it basically terminated the natural fractures from both the top and bottom. And so this kind of ductile layering can have a significant impact on natural fracture propagation. These natural fractures have the same mechanical mechanism, basically opening mode propagation, as hydraulic fractures. So we would expect our hydraulic fractures to have difficulty propagating through those types of features. Here's another example of natural fractures in a actual um, unconventional play. This is from the Monterey Formation in, in California. This is an outcrop sample. And you can see that we have a natural fracture that's white here that's propagating through the sample. It's actually quartz filled. And I have layering of darker gray layers and white layers. And you can see in the, the dark layers, which are more silicious and carbonate rich, we get vertical propagation of the natural fracture. On these whiter layers, which are more phosphatic rich, that natural fracture actually propagates parallel to bedding. And so again, these are the kinds of things. It's the same mechanism of failure as a hydraulic fracture. These kinds of bedding plane, or bed, this is actually the bedding interface, can impact our prop, fracture propagation. The final natural example I want to show you before I go to the laboratory is to look at an example of natural fractures interacting with other natural fractures, pre-existing natural fractures. And the reason why I think these are enlightening is because these natural fractures I'm talking about, these opening mode fractures, are fluid-driven fracture propagation. So they're, again, analogous, maybe at a different level of pressure, but analogous to our hydraulic fracture examples. So looking at this sample that I've cut in half with a saw cut, you can see there's several interacting natural fracture cases. And I'll go through this in more detail, but I have two cases where the, nat the later natural fracture diverts along the pre-existing fracture. And then I have one case where the later natural fracture just propagates right across the pre-existing fracture. And so if we look at this sample, you can see the bedding is outlined by these dashed lines that I've put on here. 
there's some layer parallel veins that are in this fracture or in this sample that could potentially interact with natural fractures. And then I have some basically cross bed veins or, or veins that are almost perpendicular to um, the bedding. And so if I look at um, all these pre-existing structures, the bedding, the bedding parallel vein, and this cross bed vein, then I look at the later natural fractures. Now I've got two fractures, this labeled 2A and 2B. Um, one of them is very wide. You can see the, the 2A fracture comes up. It hits the yellow fracture, propagates along that trend. It's a little bit hard to see, but you can see it actually propagates along that trend and then kinks off and continues on. The same thing happens with um, cross bed vein number 2B. It hits the yellow fracture, propagates along the yellow fracture, and then kinks along. The final case is basically where the red hits the blue in the bottom right-hand corner of this diagram, and you can see there the, the natural fracture propagated right across. And so we have diversion and crossing of um, in the in the same in the same layer for for various size pre-existing fractures. This summary here basically says what I, I just went through, but again, this analogy that I like to say is that these natural veins are fluid-driven fractures. Um, bedding planes and pre-existing veins can cause diversion, and it looks like in the previous case, um, I'll show this in the laboratory, but vein thickness seems to impact the chance of, of later fractures being diverted by pre-existing fractures. So we we're basically we're fortunate enough to get some core donated to us from ExxonMobil from the Marcellus to do some laboratory experiments to test some of these concepts. And if you look at this core, you can see this is a, a standard 4-inch diameter core. I've got a couple of calcite-filled veins that are in that core. Um, this work is described in this paper by Lee et al., um, one of my graduate students. And we basically took this core and we machined um, through saw cuts and grinding some semicircular bending samples, which is a standard fracture mechanics test that's used for fracture toughness. We were mostly interested in the aspect of fracture propagation here. And so you basically take that sample, you put it in a uniaxial press machine um, set on a couple of three rollers, one, one roller on the top and two rollers on the bottom. When you compress this sample, it basically drives a crack coming out of a pre-machined pre slot, and we propagate this crack, this tensile crack, into pre-existing veins. And so here's an example of what it looks like for um, vein propagation in this sample you can see. And you can see from the notch, this fracture propagated up. It hit the pre-existing vein and then diverted along it. And the very interesting thing, which we were very surprised about here, was notice that there's calcite on both sides of this fracture that, prop that propagated through this vein, which means that the weak um, part of this Marcellus sample was not the bonding of the calcite to the shale on the periphery of the vein, but was actually internal strength of the calcite within the vein. And if you look at the bottom of my diagram here, I have a thin section picture showing um, the vein from this sample. 0.5 millimeter scale bar here, one in plain polarized light. You can see these little um, dots that are running parallel to the vein margin. These are fluid inclusion trails, which basically reflect how the natural vein formed. And these fluid inclusion trails basically represent zones of weakness within this pre-existing fracture that the hydraulic, fra well, this, this tensile fracture can later take advantage of. I'll try and apply this to hydraulic fracturing a little bit later. Other things that we see are have were consistent with what people have seen looking at frictional interfaces. A bunch of work has been done on that. We're looking at cemented interfaces, but the approach angle seems to be important. More orthogonal approach, approach of the propagating fracture makes it more likely to cross. More oblique approach makes it less likely to cross. The other thing that was a, a bit surprising, but maybe we should have uh, anticipated this, but the thickness of the vein was very important. So in these samples, these four samples, it was all the same loading, orthogonal approach. In the thin veins, we had crossing. In the thicker veins, we had diversion, and actually diversion all the way across. Um, you can see in these thick veins, the, the propagating fracture was completely captured by the pre-existing veins. So just to summarize here, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this equation, but, but not only do we see qualitatively how these fractures propagated, uh, these tensile fractures propagated through veins and interacted with veins, we're also able to quantify the strength parameters are important that you might use for modeling um, if you're trying to look at hydraulic fracturing in the subsurface. And so one of the parameters we're able to quantify is this parameter called criti critical energy release rate. Um, which is a standard fracture mechanics parameter, which is a square of fracture toughness divided by Young's modulus, the plane strain Young's modulus. And we found that that energy release rate parameter of the veins was about one quarter of the shales, and that explains why they're zones of weakness. 
a little bit surprising was if you actually do the toughness um, comparison, the veins, the calcite veins are actually stronger with regard to toughness in the shales. But notice that this overall strength for whether the fracture, the fracture propagates or not includes Young's modulus. So the stiffer um, components of the, sh of the fractured shale, naturally fractured shale, actually see higher stresses and that's why they fail prior to the shale. And that's why they're, those, those cemented veins actually give us um, zones of weakness. So let me just, just wrap up this part of our, our presentation today with saying, okay, so I, I just did some tensile cracks propping, propagating through samples on the lab bench. What about fluid-driven cracks? Do we see similar types of, of results? And so I'm going to show you some, an example, one example from our small-scale laboratory hydraulic fracturing experiments. So these are supposed to be analogous to what we see in the field. Here's an example from the Barnett Shale where a vertical fracture was, um, or a vertical well was hydraulically fractured. And from the microseismic, the interpretation was that there was some crosshatch type propagation of fractures out into the formation. This diagram on the right shows this best. If you imagine there's a well to the north, the hydraulic fracture is propagating to the south. It hits a pre-existing joint or vein. The fluid gets diverted. One fracture tip turns into two, and that happens over and over again as the hydraulic fracture moves away from the well bore, creating the complexity we've been talking about. We all know that we discovered all of this incredible complexity in the 2000s when we started working in the Barnett Shale, although it turns out in the 1980s, people were publishing these concepts about tight gas sandstone. So everything that is new um, is not necessarily new. So, so anyway, so let me go on to the experiment. We have a cube, a, a foot cube of gypsum-based cement, a hydrostone block. You can see the well bore coming in from the side. We pump our hydraulic fracture experiments. Inside that block, we have our well bore, which is perforated, as well as some embedded natural fractures. This slide says glass slides, but we actually use um, uh, less strong materials as well, like pre-existing pla um, cast plaster um, veins. We stick that in an apparatus which allows us to have three independent stress directions similar to the stress state in the subsurface. And we basically incre or, uh, pressurize those flat jacks with air to get our test conditions. When we're all done with the experiment, we basically um, chisel the block open and, like a sculptor, find what our final product is for our, our fra fracture propagation experiment. So if you look at this picture of the block, you can see the red stained areas where the hydraulic fracture was propagating. The well bore is in the upper left. The purple lines show how the, the dominant fracture direction parallel to SH max occurred. Then you can see this natural fracture diverted some of the fracture propagation and caused a step in the fracture propagation um, path. If I take half of the block away and look at this in more detail, you can see um, the larger fracture surface, which is the red stained surface. We have a well bore here. The fluid propagates out from the well bore, creating the, the dominant hydraulic fracture parallel to SH max. In the upper part of the diagram, you can see the natural fracture diverted the fracture, and we go from one crack tip to two. That's um, what we expected. The thing that was less than expected, but again, we should have anticipated it perhaps, is notice that our natural fracture is only about two inches tall. Our hydraulic fracture is about seven or eight inches tall. And part of the fracture actually diverts beneath the natural fractures. So even though part of our fracture path was diverted, some of it continued on in the general trend. And so we actually had um, different kinds of propagations at different vertical levels within um, the fractured block. So just to summarize then, this first part of our presentation, um, shale gas and, and tight oil have been incredibly beneficial to the U.S. economy. Um, I've just tried to highlight a few of the, the geologic and geomechanical aspects of this. Um, that control hydraulic fracture complexity and really focusing on this interaction of hydraulic fractures with natural fractures. The laboratory testing gives us great insight and also gives us quantitative numbers that can then be used in later planning and modeling stages. Um, and I just want to finish up with um, acknowledging the funders of, of my work, which is the FRAC um, Research Consortium at the University of Texas, which is a collaboration between the Bureau of Economic Geology and the Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering Department. So thank you for your time, and I'll pass it on to McCool. So um, I'm going to uh, follow on from where John left off and uh, talk a little bit about uh, issues relating to well spacing, fracture spacing, sequencing, and how what John talked about can be applied to uh, optimizing um, all of these things in a pad fractured uh, horizontal situation. 
before I, I go any further, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all the sponsors of the research. Um, all, the, all these uh, different companies have funded our research for many years and we are grateful for their support. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge uh, the people involved, uh, many of the research staff and the graduate students, uh, both current and recent graduates of the program uh, that have been involved in, the, in this work. Uh, in fact, the work I'm presenting is really uh, based on a lot of the, uh, the simulations, et cetera, that they've, that they've performed. So um, what I thought I would do was, uh, was uh, uh, talk to you about some ideas that may be worth trying in the field um, in your in your uh, operations and I've listed five of them I don't have the time to go through all five I will go through the first two and then uh, uh, hopefully whet your appetite and get you curious about the other three as well so the first one I'm going to talk about is is, is, is uh, uh, treating fracture design uh, as a multi frac multi weld problem and um, trying to see if we can reach an optimum in terms of well spacing, fracture spacing, and fracture sequencing, uh, and see if we can find ways in which we can do that. Historically, the way we've done fracture design is uh, through a single well uh, fracture model. Um, what I would try to convince you of is the fact that when you do uh, multiple fractures in a horizontal well and have multiple wells in a single pad, this fracture design problem becomes much more complicated and in fact involves not just the fracture design for a single fracture, but in fact the fracture design for uh, all of the different fractures and in, fa and in fact the, the spacing between the wells. This is what makes the, the, this, this uh, design experience uh, more complex and uh, which is why we really don't have any general consensus uh, even within a given play as to what the optimum well spacing should be, what the uh, uh, pumping rates and the uh, mass of sand pump should be and so forth. We really have too many variables and too little data and so the expensive, uh, the, the learning can be very expensive. Um, what I would uh, state is that we've learned based on the work we've done over the last decade or more that it is, there's a real significant advantage to accelerating this learning process by learning both from existing wells, by doing data analysis, but also applying physics-based models and combining the two and iterating between the field uh, data and these physics-based models. And hopefully, uh, this is something that you can accomplish uh, within your organization. So let me show you an example of some modeling that was done here um, in which there's uh, a, a stage being pumped and there's four clusters uh, with, with uh, four fractures growing simultaneously uh, in, 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 into a rock. And what you find is that out of the four clusters, really two fractures are growing um, to their full potential, whereas the other two uh, fractures aren't growing very much at all. In fact, the second fracture here, Q2, is, uh, is not uh, growing hardly at all. Um, the other thing you notice is that the fractures are turning and uh, getting uh, fairly complex in their shapes. Uh, this is entirely a result of the stress shadow that John mentioned uh, between these uh, simultaneously propagating fractures um, induced by the changes and stresses that occur as the fractures open and compete for fluid and as they grow. So um, you notice that this, the, the sigma H min is changing um, based on where you are. Uh, this is a three-dimensional simulation, so there is a, a vertical component to this. I'm just showing you this for simplicity. Um, and until about three or four years ago, this is not something that we could simulate. Uh, but now, uh, there are several models available that allow you to actually model the propagation of non-planar um, three-dimensional fractures and try to understand what kind of fracture propagation you're actually achieving uh, in these very complex uh, situations. So you can talk about inter-fracture interference. So these fractures are interfering with each other. If I were to do the same simulation for the next stage, which we have done, you will see that the stages interfere as well. So the fractures in this stage will interfere with the fractures in the next stage. And in fact, if you were to do these simulations in the next well, you would see fractures interfering uh, between the two wells as well. And so there are some SP papers we have on looking at interwell and interstage interference as well. Um, one of the things that you find is that you can actually see evidence of this sort of interference on the surface. And so as we did the simulations, what we realized was if there was, so on the x-axis here is the distance uh, between stages uh, from the toe of the well. 
and this is the fracture length. Uh, if, this, if the fractures aren't interfering with each other very much, then the ISIP trend between the stages is one that is fairly consistently increasing, and you don't see a huge amount of variation in the, uh, in the ISIP trends between, between stages. If you have a lot of interference between stages, uh, fractures running into each other, like you see here, see here or longitudinal fractures growing this way, um, you see a lot of uh, uh, ups and downs in the ISIP. Ideally, what you would like to have is the closure stress, but clearly you don't have enough data for to, to achieve that. So what you see here is trends in ISIP showing um, an up and down trend. And this up and down trend is a clear uh, diagnostic of fracture interference, fractures running into each other uh, between stages. Uh, this is something that we have uh, done and analyzed in the Barnett and other places with uh, several uh, dozen wells. So fracture complexity in these fracture networks can arise as a consequence of um, uh, fracture interference or, or stress interference. So, but in addition to stress shadowing, uh, uh, fracture complexity also arises due to the uh, complexity of the rock fabric itself. As John pointed out, uh, natural fractures, bedding planes, et cetera, can lead to uh, fairly complex fracture networks as, as evidenced by this microseismic um, uh, example that's, that's shown here. You can have uh, branching of fractures, you can have complex fracture networks propagating. And what I want to point out to you is that it is now possible to actually begin to include some of these complexities in our uh, fracture models and our fracture simulations. And in fact, it is these complexities that play an extremely important role in determining both the production from these wells and also in terms of uh, where the fluid and the energy of the fracture goes. Uh, keep in mind that even though you're opening up uh, all these different, different fractures during fracturing, only a small proportion of these fractures is actually going to contribute to the production because you really don't have the ability to place propent in all of these fractures. So if the fractures aren't propped, you'll have induced unpropped fractures. We call them IU fractures that will be open while you're fracturing, but will close as you start producing. And this is why we see a lot of interference uh, between fractures, frac hits and so on during fracturing, but we don't see as much inter evidence of uh, well interference uh, once you start producing. Um, that's a whole uh, topic of discussion all by itself, which we won't have time to get into, but uh, the, uh, the role of induced in unpropped fractures during production is something that we are currently exploring and is a very interesting one because a good portion of the energy that you that you inject into the well bore is actually spent in creating all these very complex fractures. Many of these fractures don't really contribute to production because they don't have any propent in them. So here's an example of a case where you have uh, a small stress contrast. Um, uh, here's a case where you have a larger stress contrast and because of the larger stress contrast, and because of the, the uh, absence of uh, uh, natural fractures, uh, you can get fairly planar fractures here, whereas you get much more complexity uh, in, this, in this example here. So both stress anisotropy and rock fabric control the propagation of these, uh, of these fractures. Here's an example of a simulation done in which um, there is uh, um, bedding planes, as the John was showing in his uh, geological examples. The yellow uh, uh, bedding planes here are weaker than the blue background uh, matrix. And what you find is that if you have a small stress contrast, these fractures will propagate and indeed turn and follow these uh, weak bedding planes. Whereas if you have a high stress contrast, uh, you will find that uh, the stress contrast, the penalty for the fracture growing out of plane is so large that the fractures will tend to grow in the direction of the sigma H max, regardless of the bedding planes. So it's this interplay between laminations and the bedding planes and the stress contrast that determines the geometry of these fractures. Uh, and, and this is a simple example, illustration of that from some of the models that we have. Uh, I should mention that this, this kind of modeling with he arbitrary heterogeneity and turning fractures, the ability to do this, including poroelasticity and including um, uh, all of the physics in here has only recently been, uh, been possible. One of the interesting thing that happens uh, when you create these fractures is in addition to the natural geologic complexity, you also end up with creating a fairly complex stress field around the fracture. So here's a very simple example. Here's the wellbore. Uh, 
and here's a planar transverse fracture. If you look at the stress contrast, the sigma H max minus sigma H min, the bright red colors are 400 PSI of stress contrast. The blue is about 40 PSI. What you notice is that there's regions of low stress contrast that develop around this fracture. And if you were to propagate a fracture in this region of low stress contrast, you're much more likely to get fracture complexity as a result of the small penalty for growing fractures out of plane. So you can generate fairly complicated fracture geometries as a result of this, uh, of this change in uh, the stress field around these growing fractures. So when we do our, uh, our design for, for fractures in a pad environment, the design workflow has changed uh, substantially. Historically, uh, we would uh, run 3D fracture models to estimate fracture dimensions and complexity. Um, and this is really all that, 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 uh, that we could do at the time. Uh, what we do now is to actually run a 3D fracture interference model that tells us about what kind of stress interference do you get. If you have five or six clusters per stage, how many effective fractures are you actually generating based on the interference between these fractures? If you have interwell interference or interstage interference, how do we account for that? So now that we have the models available to look at fracture interference, you can actually estimate the number of fractures per stage. Uh, apply this combination of learnings to a 3D reservoir model to simulate production and reservoir drainage and ultimately arrive at uh, the NPV of this um, uh, based on the fracture geometries that have been estimated based on the fracture interference models. You can also do a parametric study by changing the well spacing, the fracture spacing, and fracture dimensions. And based on this, uh, on this parametric study, make some final recommendations on sand volume, fracture sequencing, fluids, propent schedules, well spacing, fracture spacing, and so forth. So these recommendations are based now on the basis of all of these different considerations with regard to stress interference and um, in between wells and, and so forth. Here's an example of the kind of thing that the, the kind of results you might get. So uh, this axis shows the fracture spacing. Uh, this axis shows the well spacing, and that's the NPV. Uh, at a fairly optimistic uh, uh, gas price, um, which uh, would be a different number had the, if the gas price is, 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 is lower. Uh, but you, what, you, what you can see from this figure is um, a clear optimum in the, uh, in the NPV with regard to fracture spacing and with regard to well spacing. So by doing these kinds of parametric studies, you can get a fairly uh, good global optimum for well spacing, stage spacing, and then fracture design. And the problem really becomes a matter of combining these three things in some, in some sensible way. So to summarize that part of the discussion, um, there are many reasons to treat fracture design on a pad scale as opposed to a single fracture. Uh, uh, you must consider interwell and, and multi-frac uh, considerations. Interference between fractures is important. Fracture complexity, of course, is very important. And um, we must take advantage of our ability to control a fracture complexity by fracturing the, the wells in a particular sequence. I haven't talked about that, but, uh, but that is certainly uh, very important with, with zipper fracking and so forth, and an optimum sequence of fracturing in, in zipper fracks. Uh, by computing pore pressures and stresses and failure maps, uh, we can establish uh, optimal well spacings, um, locations for infills or step out wells, uh, stage spacing of the fractures and, and the actual fracture design itself in terms of the volume of sand pumped, et cetera. So th that, the ability to do this is, is fairly recent, and I think we should take advantage of, of doing this and treat this problem as a, on a pad scale as opposed to a single fracture stage. The next topic I'll talk about very briefly in the next five minutes is um, a, a, a different topic, but an, uh, perhaps uh, 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 an equally important one, and that is liquids lifting through the entire life of the wellbore. So wellbore liquids management is extremely important because it does control um, the, uh, the productivity of the well. And since, and since every unconventional well practically will uh, be an artificial lift, at least the liquids wells, I should say, will be an artificial lift for about 90% of, of its life, it's important to be able to uh, understand what's happening. And to do this, uh, we must unload liquids from the fractures, from the matrix. Understanding how this process happens 
where do fluids go, where, are the, where is the inflow coming from, and so on, is extremely important. And managing artificial lift is, is, is quite important. So one of the limitations that we have in applying these, these, uh, this technology is our ability to actually get uh, bottom hole pressures accurately in trying to estimate things from the surface. So here's an example of what happens if you try to model uh, this data, which is a simple vertical flow of, of, of uh, air and water. And you can see that many of these models can be off by a large percentage. Uh, it's not, um, it's very common, in fact, to see variations of 50 to 500 percent in the predictions that we make about, about these sorts of flows. Here's another example where uh, the data is here and many of the models, the classical models are here. We've been working on this problem for about 10 years and have actually um, uh, improved some of these models uh, to see if we can get better fits with, uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, with certainly well-published and well-established data. So here's another example. These are all the different models uh, available in, in the literature. This is the data. The dots are the data, and this is our model. Uh, but you can see the large variation among the different models available for doing this sort of, this sort of flow. So, so if we cannot predict the, uh, the flow in these vertical wells, how difficult is it going to be to do this for horizontal wells? Because in horizontal wells, you actually can be off uh, even more, especially when you have small angles and you have deviations in the well bore and so forth. So capturing this multi-phase flow in, in multilaterals is a difficult problem. Um, here's uh, the simulations that we've run on a toe-up well where the water is accumulating towards the heel of the well. And imagine that you have, let's say, 70 or 80 fractures intersecting this, um, this well bore. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the calculation of the pressures along here are critical. The calculation of the pressure gradients and the volume fraction of liquid is important in the well bore. And these, these play an important role in controlling the productivity of the well. So we're able to capture the proper trend for pressure and for gas holdup in, in, in many of these simulations. If you have an undulating well bore, the problem becomes slightly more complicated, and in fact, we have been able to model the flow of fluids in this undulating well bores quite well. We've done several case studies in the field, and you can get pressure gradients and volume fractions of liquid in the well bore, which, by the way, is connected to the fracture, which makes the problem even more important because once you connect the well bore to the fracture, if you have a lot of liquid in the well bore, you will accumulate that liquid in the fracture itself. And it's quite difficult, actually, to unload this liquid in, in these, in these well bores, uh, because the velocity required to lift this liquid out of the fracture can be can be quite high and may not be achievable in many of these fractures. So, uh, if, uh, if you take a typical case uh, as shown on the previous slide, the critical velocity required to lift this is about 8.4 feet per second. What you might actually achieve in a well that's making about five million of gas is much much smaller than that. So, what you may end up with is a fracture that looks like this. Here's the well bore which is full of propent at the bottom, may not have as much propent on, on the upper part of the fracture, and this part of the fracture is indeed going to be uh, full of liquid in many cases. So you can actually have a situation where the liquid in the well bore fills up these red fractures, and so the, the blue fractures are the ones that you're producing from. So this becomes quite important from a well productivity point of view, not because there's a pressure drop in the well bore itself, but because the well bore is connected to the fracture and the fracture is connected to the matrix, and so you can have much lower flow rates of hydrocarbons if you are putting a back pressure or a high water saturation against the formation. So we've done studies on looking at toe up and toe down wells and shown that you can actually get some significant differences in the productivity of these wells depending on the configuration of these, of these fractures. And these liquids can be produced from the well. So this is this water saturation inside the fracture after 100 days of production and you can see the liquid is still building up and is still uh, remaining in the fracture even after 100 days of production. So the same thing will happen with condensate wells, and um, with, it becomes um, more critical in these, in these gas condensate wells. There are several references that I've pointed to here. Um, and with that, I will stop uh, my presentation and uh, open it up for questions. And, and, uh, uh, Thank you, Dr. Olson and Dr. Sharma, for your interesting presentations. I now open the Q&A session with a question for Dr. Olson. 
So one of our audience is interested to know whether the viscosity of the fluids and size of the fractions impact the diversion uh, pressures, diversion of pressures. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, so yes, it's been shown, actually, we, we've done a little bit of modeling on this, but there's some published papers that have come out of Schlumberger showing that, that using slick water versus gel actually has a big impact on whether these natural fractures um, impact the propagation. Um, the other thing which McCool alluded to is um, propent sizing is also extremely important about whether these smaller um, ancillary or secondary fractures get propped or not. He talked about these induced unpropped fractures, and they can be very difficult to prop. Um, some operators take the, the, uh, the, the design of actually using very small diameter propping in order to get those things propped um, in that case. So I'll, I'll see if McCool wants to add anything to that. So, so that's absolutely right. I, I think that uh, you know the industry has been, especially in these very low permeability, unconventional rocks, the industry has been moving towards these 200 mesh propens, and there's talk of using even smaller mesh size than that, which they what they're calling micro uh, propens. So certainly, um, the ability to prop these uh, very small aperture fractures is very important. We know they exist, and we know they exist because we see frac hits and we see tracer um, uh, connectivity and, and uh, pressure uh, pressure connectivity during fracturing. But um, once you start producing, you don't see that sort of connectivity. So I have another question, have another question. for Dr. Sharma. Uh, how does the geometry of shear fra failure induced fracture looks like? Uh, is the question from one of our Sure. Sure. So, so it is possible to get shear failure um, in, in um, some of these rocks, particularly if they have planes of weakness in them. Uh, so if there's natural fractures or if there's, there's uh, bedding planes along which shear can occur, then you can certainly uh, see uh, evidence of shear failure. In fact, in some of the microseismic data that's been collected, um, there's, there's some fairly clear evidence of um, um, Shear failure, because otherwise you wouldn't see microseismic events, right? Microseismic events are primarily determined by shear failure. Um, how important a role these shear shear cracks play in production is unclear. Um, they clearly occur because of the microseismic activity, uh, but my gut feeling is, and I don't have anything to prove this, uh, uh, based on production testing and so forth, that they really don't play uh, as important a role as they should during production. Dr. Olson, you spoke about uh, the complex interaction between the hydraulic fracturing and the in-situ planes of weakness. Could you please speak about the state of geology in the shale industry to characterize these in-situ fractures? So, so the, um, the characterization of these natural fractures is, is something that um, actually we have quite a few people here at UT working on. Um, there's a lot of different approaches to this. Um, one of the things I showed in my slides was that oftentimes shales will be more intensely natural or fra naturally fractured than sandstones. One of the things we've discovered that might be responsible for that is essentially this idea that um, shales are very sensitive to the chemistry of the fluids in them during the fracturing process, and that can get you a different sequence of fracture propagation, which allows for this closer spacing. Um, another thing that's very important in the geologic description of these natural fractures is the presence or absence of cements. And um, our group has worked quite hard on, on looking at shales and, and whether there's calcite or silica-based cement that gets cemented in these shales. And the prediction of that basically requires some subsurface um, site-specific information but also we've been doing some diagenetic modeling to show how these um, fracture sizings are very systematic. If you can get some observations at one scale, oftentimes you can use some sort of geostatistical model to extrapolate those sizings to other scales. So, so it's a big avenue of um, investigation. The last thing I would just mention is, is one of the things we're trying to do in the laboratory is to try and look at the strengths of these as well. So you need to know where are they, how many of them there are, what's inside of them, and then how strong they are. Well, the next question is, can the number of induced and unpropped fractures be improved by reactionary chemistry? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and um, so we've been looking at the possibility of keeping 
the induced uncropped fractures open by using um, acids. So you could, for example, use a very dilute uh, hydrochloric or organic acid because obviously it's much easier to get fluids into these very small uh, aperture cracks than propent. So if you can get fluid in there, um, what if you were to etch the surfaces of these fractures? And by etching these surfaces, uh, can you maintain conductivity in these fractures? So this, that's a very distinct possibility. There's actually been two field trials done of this technology in the Eagle Bird uh, that, that uh, I, I've designed those, those treatments and our group has been involved in running the experiments. Um, unfortunately, none of that is published yet. Um, the danger in doing this, of course, is that you dissolve the hard material, the calcite, and um, that then um, provides a way for the fractures to close more easily because uh, you now have removed the hard material and you are leaving behind the clay material that is more mushy, for a better term. Um, and so the fractures can close more easily. So that's the downside of using these reactive fluids. So the balance is how do we maintain fracture conductivity by reacting and etching the surfaces of these fractures while keeping them propped open and not allowing the clays to, to uh, completely close these fractures. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Olson, how do you see the future of regulations regarding induced seismicity? Um, that's a, a very good and I think challenging question. Um, so there's a lot of activity um, going on here. Um, as you know, Oklahoma has a significant um, significant seismicity increase over the past few years. Um, I think the regulation um, framework part of part of that is is uh, basically um, there's a there's a strong need for data for us to better understand what's going on I think one of the things that most of us believe that work in the hydraulic fracturing and geomechanics world is the predominant um, or the most likely driver for induced seismicity is actually not hydraulic fracturing but it is um, is wastewater disposal and um, there's a lot of avenues of, of research and engineering design that can address that. You know, can we do things with less water? Can we shut off produced water? Can we reuse produced water um, in order to not have to inject it and dispose of it? That's that that recycling is, has been gone on in a big way in Pennsylvania, for instance. Um, so on the regulatory side, I think um, one of the things that we're trying to do is we think that that better educated regulators would have a better um, interaction with um, inter interaction with the operators and so we have a program called top core where we actually um, train regulators in the fundamentals of oil and gas science so they're they're more experienced and effective when they're out in the field working with operators um, but as far as the regulation goes I would say one of the big steps would be um, just to, to provide better data one of the big hamstrings in this whole process is is injection wells um, those operators don't have to report data um, in a very timely fashion or in a very, um, they just basically report monthly data, for instance, but it's like six or six months or nine months in arrears. Dr. Sharma, do induced shear fracture intersect with tensile fractures so that the shear fractures can be propped by propants? Uh, I think what controls whether the, uh, the fracture gets propped or, or receives any propant, of course, is the aperture of the fracture. And the aperture of the fracture is, um, most of the shear failure cracks that you see are typically of small aperture. And um, so it is difficult to place any propant in them um, primarily because of their small aperture. And getting them to be, um, uh, to, to be wider is, is, is quite challenging. So I, I think it's going to be very difficult to actually create um, ancillary fractures or induced unprop uh, or induced fractures that are wide that go out of plane from the main fracture direction. But that is a hard thing to do. Um, so my, my belief is that you would have to try to address that problem by using smaller propant or by using reactive fluids that will then keep those uh, fractures open through etching of the fracture surfaces. Dr. Olson, would you please explain uh, how would you optimize the number of clusters per stage and number of stages in well? You just look at a single stage. Um, one of the important aspects of that is essentially looking at the interaction between the fractures as they're simultaneously propagating from these multiple clusters. Usually we have anywhere between three and five clusters per stage. And so the way we, we've um, 
looked at this through a modeling perspective, and what we found is that um, if you want all of the fractures to grow roughly equally, one of the things to pay attention to is the size of the stress shadow of each fracture. And that depends very strongly on the height of the propagating fracture. And that stress shadow um, size scales roughly with the height of those fractures. And so if you have perf clusters that are spaced broader apart than the height of the anticipated fracture, that can help reduce destructive interference. Although if you look at practices in the field, oftentimes operators are putting their clusters much closer together than that. And so other ways to help ensure um, more uniform propagation would be to um, work hard on the limited entry design so that the fluid isn't allowed to be um, diverted into one fracture over another. Um, one of the very interesting things which, which, which we're actually trying to confirm experimentally um, is that there was a, a recent paper by Pearson Bunger talking about irregular spacing. And they actually found that if you put irregular spacing of your clusters regular, rather than regular spacing, you get more equal length propagation of the involved simultaneous fractures. And we're trying to confirm that in the laboratory as well, but I think that's a very interesting concept that, that um, the, the nature of the spacing can actually influence the, the uh, how the fractures propagate. The last part of the question was how many stages. I think um, I'll defer to McCool on that in, in that he showed that diagram of well spacing and fracture spacing trying to optimize MPV. So it's basically a cost and production related equation that needs to be optimized there. And it, it really depends on the performance of your um, performance of your formation and the well spacing to determine how many stages in the, in the spacings between the stages. You, how would the use of CO2 in the frac fluid affect unloading and microfracture production? Uh, before I answer that, let me just add a little bit to what John was saying earlier. I, I think the, uh, the, the state spacing and the well spacing are, are, um, can be optimized not in isolation, but in conjunction with the volume of sand that you pump in each stage. So really all those three things, how much water and how much sand you pump, what the well spacing is and how many stages you have in a well. Those are all coupled questions. And they're very much related to the costs associated with each thing. What's the cost of drilling? What's the cost of completion and so forth? So that's why I showed you that NPV plot where uh, so to get an optimum NPV is very much a function of the, local, the price environment and the costs of doing all these different things. Now, in terms of using uh, energized fluids, uh, we've been working on using CO2 and other energized fluids for quite a long time. And uh, the geometry of the fractures that you get when you use these types of fluids is quite different than the geometry of fluids that you get with more incompressible fluids like water. And, and, and typically what you see with these compressible fluids is that um, you get less, typically less branching. You get more uh, growth of the, of the primary fracture. Um, and in many cases, uh, uh, the, the transport of the propen and so on is quite different in these. So that's a fairly um, extensive topic for discussion as to what the differences are in the geometry of the fractures, but they are different. So compressible fluids uh, will behave differently than incompressible fluids. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you uh, for answering the questions and uh, for the interesting presentations. And many thanks uh, to the audience for attending today's webinar. We will send more information on the next webinar as soon as the date is set. You can sign up for updates on the Knowledge Pipeline page uh, of our website listed on the final slide. So I encourage you to contact our speakers after the webinar for further discussions and questions about their presentations. If you're going to claim CEU credit, don't forget to click on the verification link on the final slide. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on the CPGE website early next week. Thank you again for joining us, joining us today and have a wonderful weekend.